House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. David Martino is here. I'm here. <laughs> You've had all these days yeah. off. What are you doing with your days off? Well, I watched The Wizard of Oz in 4K. <laughs> well, somebody has to. That's great. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's getting close to 100 years old. Yeah, it is. It's it's at least 80. Yeah, getting up to, to my yeah. age. Right. Um, <laughs> wow, wow. So is that the first time you've ever seen it? No. I mean, well, it used to be like a big thing in the States. It was It was on once a year, at least through the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. Yeah. But I hadn't seen it for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. that used to be that way uh, even in Canada, yeah. Kanakistan, uh, yeah. you know, because we had an American channel. We didn't know what TV was, so <laughs> we would all get dressed up and sit down and watch, you know, Wizard of yeah. Oz, you know. But it still makes you cry, does it? It does. You're such it does. A... I, no, I, I tell you, it, it was just, it's done so well, and the transfer is so good. And uh, Judy Garland's performance in that is is immaculate. It's just it's just great. Yeah, it did. It made me it made me tear up multiple times. Was that because the <laughs> witch got crashed by the house? Yeah, exactly. That's why. That's why yeah, I was really. Crying. Or the one that's melting. I'm melting. The melting thing. <laughs> I'll get you, my little pretty, and your little dog Toto too. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But yeah, for you know what's considered a children's movie, I thought it was better. Then all the movies combined for 2022. I thought, I thought it was more entertaining than if you combine all those movies in 2022. Um, Wizard of Oz beats all of them at once. Well, Sly Stallone's <laughs> going to have something to say to you. Yeah. <laughs> and so is Bruce Willis. Well, he would if he yeah. no, I guess yeah. not. But Sly Stallone <laughs> is going to have something to say about you. <laughs> you know, just so you know. Um, That's right. Oh, well, they could do a remake. Call me. Yeah, well, I'll give them your number. Hey, and the remake. <laughs> the remake. Uh, they should do a remake, and they can have Gwyneth Paltrow play oh. the uh, <laughs> play Judy Garland's part, you know. Oh, no. And she can have, like, nope. her scented candle that smells like a vagina <laughs> in, her, in her bag, <laughs> in her basket as she's running down that. You know, that would be crazy. Speaking of that, you know, I, 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 the reason I bring her, I've got her in my mind, is because I thought she kind of was at the top when she came up with a scented candle like her own vagina. Like, I, I was just like, <laughs> wow, this is crazy, right? What a world. Yeah, yeah. But now, Kardashian has done one step further. Really? Yeah. She's, it, it's, it's, just, it's just amazing. So now she's got new gummies out. And so Uh-oh. when you hear gummies at first, you're first thinking, well, what? marijuana gummies or something like yeah, that right yeah. no no this is this is something totally you're not going to expect this okay? okay these gummies are apparently reported to make your vagina smell better and taste better okay Mine? well you, well <laughs> speak yeah well this this is what i've heard oh. but uh, but yeah this is this is going to revolutionize the world it is. <laughs> I don't know where things are going oh, in this world, you know, I tell you. But, it's um, a crazy world. Now, speaking of gummies and vaginas, we've got a okay. uh, super <laughs> natural. <laughs> no, we've got a great guest on today, and he writes more in the fantasy science fiction world, so that kind of ties in. Not that he's using the gummies, okay? No, no. Um, so now his his book is called The Grand Game, and he is uh, the writer. Yeah, of course he is. That's Tim Ahrens. So thank you for being here, Tim. Nice to have me on your program. I definitely appreciate it. And, uh, Dave, I can tell you a couple of anecdotes about The Wizard of Oz if you're interested later on. Oh, sure. Uh, oh, secrets beyond. <laughs> yeah. All the dirt. All the be- Well, yeah, come on. Had Judy, Judy Garland in there, right? So she was, <laughs> yeah. you know. She was probably high. Well, for instance, um, Mar- Margaret Hamilton, who played the witch, um, nearly got sent to the hospital the first time that they did the fire incident where she disappeared from the uh, village. 
Oh wow! Because it actually actually almost set her her face on fire because she was too close to the to the uh, flame uh, pots when they when they dropped her. Oh wow! <laughs> Michael Jackson copied that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's back before you know you know, insurance policies. <laughs> no shot. <Things> like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll just replace her. You know. Yeah. <laughs> she needed she needed the new Kardashian gummies. That's right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> things would have been good then. So how did you get into this writing? Like, why why are you writing? Um, I started writing on suggestions of a whole group of friends of mine I used to play Dungeons and Dragons with. I used to game master about oh god about ten people when I was in four, when I was fourteen or fifteen or something like that. And you'd had to world build and design and build characters and 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 work out adventures. In which case, a bunch of people wanted me to start writing some of those down because they thought they were so fun. So that's what got me started writing. Uh, what got me into the horror business was my father. I used to start watching um, horror movies with him when I was 10 on, on Friday or Saturday nights. That's what the things we did. We got together and watched the Universal Monster movies or Hammer Horror or something like that. And, and then that's got me into horror. So when I started started to take my writing seriously at the uh, fantasy and horror just kind of got mixed together <laughs> game master oh so yeah. what is that you're a game master you know i was thinking of, on different terms you know creating your own worlds and and adventures but that in my mind it's something really dirty but what what, <laughs> what really goes on in dungeon and dragon and game master and all that so what what is that you basically um are creating a world for your players um it's usually the world of greyhawk when i when i played um it, they also have forgotten realms now and a whole bunch of other different realms in that particular game genre and then each of the your players creates a playing character like a thief or a fighter or a wizard or whatever they happen to want to be, and a race and, and, a, and a gender and such and so forth. And then um, they all go off on quests that the game master creates. He's the also also the one that sets the rules for the game, keeps uh, the dice rolls fair, <laughs> makes sure nobody's fudging. <laughs> So it's, um, it is a whole lot of fun to, to game master to play the game itself. In fact, I'm still glad all these years later since I started playing it in the early uh, late 70s, early 80s, I'm still glad it's out there and been going strong. Yeah, Dave does that still. With oh, I used cat. to, yeah. Him and his cat do that. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the cat always wins. Yes. Well, that, but doing that over and over, I guess – since an early age, do you think that kind of is what got your creative process going? Definitely. This it definitely taught me how to world build and how to character build. And when I write these days, I'm a definitely uh, I do it the same way I used to game master. So I'm I do it from a hundred percent character perspective. Um, I know there's a lot of writers out there. Nothing wrong with it who like to um, fill you in on a whole bunch of stuff on the uh, how do you put it the um, background or what. Um, what a forest looks like for four pages. <laughs> I tend to I tend to like to show my audience what's going on in the book from the character perspective, so you see what the character sees, and you don't end up reading like I mean I, I love Tolkien, but he used to do this a lot. You don't end up reading you know five paragraphs about a tree unless you're reading my book. Oh no, I don't say that. <laughs> I think you'd probably do a fine job. I'm sure. <laughs> No, I do ten chapters on it. <laughs> now, well, so what is world be- building like? So for someone that is outside of that realm and someone listening that doesn't exactly understand what that means. So what, what is world building? Good question. World building is um, the the place or genre um, and area in which you want to write your book from and where you want your character to exist. So if you're going to build a world, it'd be like, oh, say if you're going to build a fantasy world, you'd first try to come up with the time period or the age in which the world's taking place, where there's the Bronze Age before the Iron Age, um, 1200s, you know, 1000s, whatever you, you decide you want to do with it, how much the technology level is. Um, then you can put in the factors of, is it a normal world like this one is? that you breathe oxygen? You have a blue sky and regular Earth. Or you can change that around if you want to do science fiction or extra dimensional stuff. Or even in fantasy, you can change that around depending on how um, dark and creepy you want to get for dark fantasy. For instance, in, uh, in the grand game in, in Dark Creatures, a series, there's a world called Dark Creatures that's um, not a very nice place. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, so you, just, you basically design your world that the characters are, or you, uh, in your book are going to be moving around in. Uh, that's what world building, building would be. And when you do that, then you also populate it with the, with the type of people that are in there, whether they're peasants, monsters, um, chaos, gods, whatever you decide you want to do. And you smash this all together into a story, and um, it's kind of like watching a movie when you write it. Well, do you create the world first like you would uh, maybe uh, dungeon mastering or game mastering in a role playing game, or do you uh, tend to create it as you write the story? Um, I tend to have a, a, a rough outline of what type of world I'm creating um, before I start. Uh, that gives me uh, something to fall back on in case something goes wrong when I'm <laughs> when I'm writing the book. <laughs> um, but um, the people and places that develop within the book uh, tend to develop on their own as I write it. So I just have the I have the basic outline of the world itself, and then as as time moves through the book, things um, pop up um, or are designed that way. So so game masters like you, and when you're writing uh, this book, for instance, the grand game, and you're putting together the world for this book, um, you have gods and goddesses and stuff like that. You know, um, goddess of magic, you know, and all that stuff. Is there rules that you have to follow creating a world and, and developing these gods, or do you use kind of um, already created gods and goddesses in other people's work? Like, how does that work? Uh, well, in my work, um, I kind of fancy the, the thought that if people enjoy the book, that they'll look more into the gods and goddesses that, I, that I'm using. So I actually use historical figures like Circe, uh, which is a Greek goddess of magic, or the Januses, which is the gods of past, present, and future in Rome. Um, uh, there's Lilith. She's the first woman in Jewish mythology. So <clears throat> I tend to, to research a lot of those characters, and then I, I transplant their personalities into the book and give them the, the objective for being where, where they're being or doing what they're doing within the book. Because I kind of hope people look into that because it's a fact that each one of those has a fascinating story behind them. And then if I need something extra like um, I Am, for instance, is a god I created for the grand game. He's, a, he's an elder god right out of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, I borrowed um, a little of the, of the taint of the mythos from H.P. Lovecraft, but I never, I didn't actually, um, you know, I didn't take a lot from him, so I can't say I, I, I plagiarized him or anything, even though he's public domain. Um, I just don't like doing that, so I, I, I designed a god with him in mind. Um, uh, I'll do that. But, um, usually I'll try not to create a god of, of my own making unless the story calls for it. And in, and in this particular case, with, with Dark Creatures, a series, um, I'd rather use the, the already established gods because it brings people more down to earth with it, I guess. Right. Yeah. Or well, because then they they can latch on to that if if their followers or they're interested in that, they'll know it already, right? True. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you see uh, what Thor did to that uh, statue of uh, Jesus down in Brazil? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> you didn't. See that? Oh, yeah, lightning hit. Oh, did it? That. You know that big. Uh, statue yeah. that's it's yeah. known for right down there and stuff like yeah mm -hmm. big lightning bolt hit i actually posted it on uh on social media because it was pretty exciting did it damage the statue at all or i you know i don't know i it probably caused some damage but it didn't it, i don't think it destroyed it but it was funny i had to say well <laughs> i guess thor got tired of all this jesus stuff so yeah, it could be <laughs> zeus though he might just be upset <laughs> yeah zeus he's, he's making a comeback there you go don't call it a comeback <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. Yeah, I thought it was kind of crazy. Um, anyway, now you've got a lot of elements in this, so you, it's the grand game. So for someone like me, explain what that means. What is the grand game? Okay, so um, my series of books I'm writing right now is is called the Dark Creatures series. It's it's basically about the world of dark creatures and or dark creatures in our world that have slipped into our world from that dimension or have been placed here or people who have disappeared from our world and slipped into that dimension. The The first book is called The Simple Game, and that's basically what happens is you have forgotten gods from all throughout history who no longer have any power to affect the real world. But you can't just leave them in a pocket dimension because they're going to get themselves in trouble. So what happens is they, they give them an outlet to use their power called um, Dark Creatures. Um, a, it's, a, it's a game they play in an auditorium amongst themselves. And they could choose one person 
for good, for the side of good, and one person for the side of evil, and then two gods play against each other. It's kind of like a great big, huge game of living chess. So the grand game, then, is what happens is that in the first book, the geniuses are just playing a simple game, and it gets out of hand. Um, if anyone, one of the rules of this is if anyone finds out of that, that there are gods playing with human lives or if people disappear in this, this, this particular way, that the universe or those that the deities who are in control of the universe or the universe itself, however much you want to consider or, or, or envision the universe to work, uh, will make that disappear or vanish or reset things. And um, when, the, when their game gets out of control, they're afraid that they're going to be punished and they don't want to be punished and they don't want you know any other problems going on. The last big problem that happened when a grand game took place was um, Roanoke, Virginia. And if you're familiar with the history of Roanoke, you'll know that the entire settlement just vanished. No one is. If people in the who are listening to this are not familiar with Roanoke, I really, I really wish they'd look up, look it up because it's a fascinating story. Um, they had a whole settlement there. God, I think it was the 1700s, 16. I might be a little bit earlier, late. But, and when the person who went back to England who had set the colony up came back, they were gone. Uh, there were still buildings there. Some buildings were completely, you know, disassembled, and some buildings are still there. There were still cups on the tables. Uh, <laughs> the entire populace had just vanished. They moved to Canada. And the, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, or um, you know, um, Brazil. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hanging out in Rio. There you go. <laughs> and um, anyway. So um, the second book, The Grand Game, happens because the geniuses who are playing the simple game want to try to hide this from any other greater power that might cause them problems. So they create a grand game, which is a game of more than two gods, which means you, they bring in three more gods to play this game and try to bring it to an end quickly. Those three gods can then choose their three human pawns to play within the game, and then those three human pawns can thus choose or create their monsters or characters within the world of dark creatures that they can play. So it's a three level, it's a three level game. It's kind of like, um, I designed it off of the, an old Star Trek episode where you see Captain Kirk um, and Mr. Spock playing fourth dimensional chess. Most of your time writing this book, maybe I'm wrong, but most of the time you spend putting a book together like this is to do with research and setting up all the, all the, um, I guess the uh, the setting and everything I would imagine would be the the most amount of work. Yeah, the most amount of work I run into is researching the gods and making sure I have you're correct. Make sure I have the setting correct. Um, make sure that I'm not going to go so far out in a limb that people go, "Oh God, I'm just going to put this down." <laughs> well, that's it's it's crazy. How long does it take? Like for instance, with the grand game, then how long did it take you to put that book together? Well, um, since I have a full time job, I can only write maybe one or two hours a day. In, in most cases, because I have a 40-hour a week job, and then I get home, and when I get home from that, because I work retail, so my hours go up and down depending on when I go into work. And I can sit, I sit down after work and relax for about an hour or so, and then I'll turn my computer on and I'll try to at least, I set myself a goal of, of writing it for at least an hour. Sometimes it goes longer than that, but it really depends on what my stamina is at the time. But um, the grand game took me about a year, year and a half to write. And and then I was lucky. I ran across a friend of mine at work who had um, who knew an artist. His name was um, James Reich, who did all the black and white artwork within the book. Um, I've got about five or six different pictures and uh, several different maps that go on within the book that he did all in black and white. He does a fantastic job. Well, that's that's crazy. So when you when you're working uh, retail then and you do your eight hours a day dealing with people and you come home, sit down and uh, and you turn on your computer and you're going to get ready to, to start writing. You know, when you have really bad customers, do you sort <laughs> of like uh, use their personalities and use use your experience with people in the day at your job? I tend to, I, depending on what I'm writing in the book, if I'm writing uh, Doug Pimpkin, which is my um, insane um, psychopath, um, yeah, then I'll, I'll, I usually pour more of the, of the uh, disgruntled emotion of, of, of a very sour customer in, into, uh, into the writing. I don't necessarily use personalities too much. Um, I, I try to tend more to, to keep it to emotion because if I use personalities, um, it, it takes away from the character I design and now it puts, makes it into the person I dislike. And I'm trying to stay away from that sort of thing. But emotional wise, um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll definitely put the, the angst or anger or disappointment or something like that into it. 
Yeah, lightning hits those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you had just mentioned maps, and I've noticed that maps are uh, very much used in fantasy novels. Now, I'm wondering how important do you think it is to have maps in a fantasy novel, and do you feel that it may kind of paint you into a corner having the world completely defined like that? That's a good question, but um, it depends. Now, if you only plan on writing, in my personal opinion, mind you, if you only plan on writing a single book um, and you want to get it out there, then, then a map isn't really that important, in my opinion, because if you should be able to convey where your people are and what situation they're in as you move through the book. If you're writing a series like I'm attempting to do or, world, or building a world like I'm attempting to do, I'm attempting to do because Dark Creatures is going to go beyond these, uh, you know, these three books I'm writing and with new characters and new situations. Then I think it's important that you do a map, uh, that you make a map of the, of the situations or the places you're working with so people can refer back to it so they don't get lost. Um, because you, you can get pretty complicated in some cases with land masses and, and mountain ranges and such like and so forth. Um, as far as getting pigeonholed or caught in the situation, uh, a world is only as big as you make it. So right now, Adirac, which is the continent I'm working with right now for this particular set of books for Dark Creatures, um, has five fiefdoms and then one, one empire in that continent. See, I can always move my stories to another continent or another area. So that's why I'm not getting caught in the corner. Your main characters. Um... How do you write your characters? Where do they come from, and what's your experience when you're writing your characters? How do you see them, feel them, hear them? Like what? Let's talk about your your how it, how it works for you. Uh, well, my two main characters, the two human main characters I have are William J. Donovan and Doug Doug Pimpkin. Um, I designed them as a, as a classic human hero and and really degenerated villain. <laughs> So um, I wanted to make William, first of all, and I, I want to make William heroic. So William J. Donovan, if, again, is another Easter egg in the book. If you look through history, you'll find that William J. Donovan is actually a World War I hero. He saved a whole platoon in World War I. And that inspired me to use his name. But um, I wanted to make him a teenager uh, because it, it, he, he clashes so nicely with Doug, who's about 35, 36. And so um, the toughest part I had designing William is to make sure he was teenager enough because I'm no longer a teenager. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to make sure that he came off as a teenager and not as an old man writing about a teenager. <laughs> um, so I had several uh, proofreaders um, that I know that go through and, and make sure that when they read those some of those those points in the book, they say, oh, no, no he's more than – he sounds just like a teenager. Oh, good. And then I, I used the after-school special tropes of um, the teenager who's just living his normal life. He's pretty much a, a somewhat of a loner. He's a gamer. He likes retro games and stuff like that. And he has a small group of friends who used to play D&D who just finds himself dropped into the situation. Um, unbeknownst to him, he agrees to enter the, the game, um, the Dark Creatures game, not thinking that it is what it actually is. You could say that God's tricked him into it, but you know, either way, he agreed to it. That's all they need. And so he's um, now trying to survive within this situation. Now that he realizes in the grand game, he realizes he's caught up in this whole situation. Now he's trying to survive and and beat the game, beat it out of it. Doug Pimpkin on the other hand, so that, uh, creating William wasn't that hard. I just pretty much had to come up with, with what a teenager would do, what the, the modern situations for a teenager might be or could be, um, what his interests were. And then I added a little few things of my own past, like uh, when I was in high school, I used to race the bus home because I didn't like pepper alleys. Um, and do little little things like that um, to, 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 to make it fun, uh, to make him fun. Doug, on the other hand, would have did a lot more research because I want to make Doug the most vile thing I could possibly think of. Um, I want to avoid making Doug into an anti-hero um, or any possible way of making him into an anti-hero. So I wanted to make him a, an incredibly vile person. So I did a lot of research on Ted Bundy. Um, I did a lot of research on Ed Gein, um, Will, John Wayne Gacy. And then I took pieces of all that, all their personalities and I kind of wrapped them all up into Doug. First time you see Doug in the book, in the simple game, and all the way through the grand game, you are going to hate Doug. <laughs> Doug is not a nice person. And, uh, so, um, and so I just, I designed him in to, to be not only repulsive as in personality, but he's also repulsive as an appearance. He's not someone when you see him walking towards you that you would want to walk past. You'd kind of want to cross the street. <laughs> 
I did that simply just to make sure that people didn't get them, you know, uh, the the inclination of, well, he could be saved, or he's, you know, he, there's good in him somewhere. No, there's there's no good in Doug. I wanted to make sure everybody knew there was no good in Doug. So that's how I designed those two guys. Um, as far as all the other characters go, um, yeah, I, I I probably just take pieces of of personalities that I like in, in you know, depending on the gender I'm dealing with, um, and then I'll take a trope, like, say, if I'm making them a fighter or a paladin, I'll take a, a woman, and I'll take, say, her psyche, and I'll put it into a setup where she's been trained to fight as a vicious killer, and they'll clash off of one another, which is always fun. But uh, yeah, I mix and match. That's, that's pretty much how I put everything together. Well, how do you create dialogue? Do, do you have an inner monologue? Can you hear your characters, or do you uh, find some other way? Yeah, no, I have an inner monologue. I actually, as I, as I think I mentioned earlier, I might have, uh, when I write, it's like watching a movie, so I'm actually just describing everything everything is going on around me. <laughs> I, I step into the main character's um, psyche, I suppose, and, and I just move through the story like you're watching a movie. Uh, so what they do is, is I, I just, I'm just describing, I've had, um, this is going to sound slightly schizophrenic, it's not meant to, but I've had arguments with, with characters and they want to go one way and I want them to go the other. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot like building a 3D world and then populating it and then walking your main character through it. Um, the best way I can describe my writing style is a, a lot of writers like to do um, an outline, a very specific outline of what they want to do moment to moment. My outlines are very vague in general. I know what's going to happen in the beginning. I know where the middle of the book is, and I know what's going to happen at the end. And up in between there, I tend to write by the seat of my pants. I tend to let everything flow forward until I get to that point, or this point, or that point. And you would be surprised what you can discover as you move along. What do you What do you think of this cat, this this genre? I guess this world building, and I guess you'd call it science fiction, and and that. Um, is there a lot of other people out there doing really good work that inspires you? Um, I'm sure I don't read a whole lot uh, uh, anymore. Um, I used to read a ton of stuff in horror and science fiction when I was um, in my 20s and 30s. Um, and, you know, they all, uh, Pierce Anthony inspired me, Stephen King inspired me, um, uh, Clive Barker inspired me. There's a, there was a lot of people in the uh, old, you know, older generation that inspired a lot of, of what I love to read and how I like to write. I don't read a lot of the newer stuff too much anymore. Um, I don't know why. I just I guess I either between work and then writing my own books and stuff, I don't get a lot of chance. But the most things, most I've read currently is a manga or um, uh, light novels from uh, Japan. My opinion, mind you, there's nothing against. I, I haven't read anything of the modern, modern too much of the modern work. But as far as movies go, I think that Japanese animation does a better job plotting than Americans do. But that's just my opinion. Well, you mentioned Piers Anthony, um, who's you know really a legendary fantasy author. I read him also when I was in high school. Um, and I, I believe he um, did a forward for one of your books. Yes, he, I was really, really impressed and very happy that he actually did. It was my first book I wrote. It was called The Salvation of Tanglegel, and he wrote a beautiful forward for it, and it made me so happy that he did. And I, I am forever grateful to him. How, how did that happen? Um, well, a friend of mine was opening her own publishing company, which just got, got me started getting books published at the time. And her husband worked for a graphics art company, and he knew someone who knew Pierce Anthony, who was a, a student of Pierce Anthony. So he asked him if he could present Mr. Anthony with my book, if he'd you know, read and tell, tell him what he thought of it. And um, luckily and happily, Pierce Anthony agreed. I was really pleased. I was, I was definitely floored. I was, I was extremely happy. Yeah. Didn't have to sleep with him or anything. No. <laughs> didn't, have to pay him, didn't have to pay him 150 bucks. Or <laughs> Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that good. does happen sometimes. Yeah, yeah it does. <laughs> what do you plan on doing um, with this writing thing? Do you think this is something that you are going to continue to do? Oh, definitely. Even um, even though I haven't moved a lot of books, and or as my friends would say, God, you're putting in a lot more money into this than you're getting out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I like it. I love publishing a book a year, maybe a book every year and a half. Um, I enjoy writing dark fantasy. I enjoy my dark creature storylines. So in my next book, which I'm working on right now, which is Dark Creatures, Worlds and Ending is finished. If I don't end up writing another book to finish up the storyline, I think I'm going to finish up with, <laughs> with this book. I'll start with another Dark Creatures book using different characters, a different setup, and a different uh, um, starting point. And I'll just keep moving forward through there because I really enjoy it. Yeah, maybe you'll get into writing romance. That I don't think is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Um, 
Well, what do you what do you want people to get out of your books? Like uh, when you put them out like that, if you're going to do one a year and you've been put out a few already, what is it? What is the best thing for you to hear that uh, people get out of it? That they enjoy it. That's my that's my number one all time goal. Uh, the thing I love the most about writing is if I'm standing by someone who's actually reading one of my words and they smile. That's that's great. That's fan. That's a great feeling. I love to make people enjoy my work. Um, I've even had people who don't like um, horror, which I write, as I said, partially dark with dark family. fantasy, enjoy the book. They enjoy the characters. Um, they just didn't like the genre too much. But I, I really love to make people smile. I love to give them a moment's peace or rest or, or distraction from what they may or may not need a distraction from. Um, that to me is what writing all about is, is all about, is, is just giving people an escape to go someplace or do something or experience something that they haven't before or might want to do you like to interact with people online do you have social media website how do people find him um you can find me on facebook through dark creatures a simple game uh, it's all one word that would that would be on on facebook you can go to my website www.thedarkcreatures all one word dot com um that you get in touch with me through that website um you can also order most of my books through that website <laughs> Um, I would be, I'm pleased and happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk to me about writing your books. The only thing I won't do is review or, or critique other people's work who do not have a published copy of their work. That's because I, I'm really gun shy about A, telling anyone how to write. Since people should, in my opinion, always develop their own writing style. And I don't like the fact that there's always a possibility later on of people coming up going, I showed you that chapter before that book was copyrighted. Now you stole it. <laughs> I guess, you, yeah, you never know. What is it you um, don't like about writing? Is there something that you find hard in the writing process? Uh, in a lot of cases, it's finding time. <laughs> that's, that's a big one. Um, advertising, I definitely, it's 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 like pulling teeth to get people to leave a review about a book. I don't know if you've discovered if you've experienced this or not, Alan, but it's it's just. It, people will buy the book, and then all you want in order to get the book it's out there. So especially on Amazon, to raise it up on Amazon, they have to leave a review. But you, it's just like pulling teeth out of an alligator to get someone to sit down and just write, "It's a good book," or "I liked it," or, or anything yeah. like that. Or I hate it. Yeah, that's the frustrating part to me is just to get people to acknowledge that you know, if, if you like the book, then leave, leave a review. <laughs> So in this book here, The Grand Game, what do you classify it as? Is it more horror or more science fiction? It's dark fantasy. So it's um, it's kind of like H.P. Lovecraft meets The Wizard of Oz. Um, that's a good way of putting it. Or Stephen King meets Lord of the Rings is another great great way of putting it. Um, because part of the Gwyneth Paltrow meets Kardashian. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, they both would take their clothes off, so I guess that doesn't really <laughs> Anyway, sorry about that. I couldn't help it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> so because part of the book takes place in the real world and what happens to that world around William. And then part of this takes place in the world of dark creatures, which is a world full of monsters and nightmares that are coexisting with humans in about the uh, uh, a time period of about the 1200s, maybe a little less than that, uh, where swords and sorcery are available and such like and so forth. And so the two monsters or fantasy characters in dark creatures in the world are actually monsters themselves. So they're kind of like anti-hero. I always thought it, it, I always had a problem with taking a monster, or even if you've designed, designed the monster a specific way and making them completely um, unblemished, such a great hero or somebody who's running for it, even though they're not like you take a vampire and turn him into a hero. That doesn't necessarily jive with me because vampires devour living things they're they're they look at things as cattle in my opinion i, I go for the bell lugosi outlook or the christopher lee outlook or anything like that so when i design a monster like that and in dark creatures i do a lot of it because um i like to change things up there are evil evil and there's gray black white evil such like and so forth so when i design a creature or a character like that i try to make them an anti-hero which is something that does the right thing for the wrong reasons <laughs> The Hammer Horrors really influenced you? Oh, yeah. I, used to, I, I, I enjoyed the heck out of uh, Hammer Horrors as much as I did the black and white stuff. Um, Christopher Lee was the last. I love um, Peter Cushing was great Frankenstein. I love their take on, on the Frankenstein monster and how they designed it. Um, and, then the, and, and using the budget that they did with those, those films, it, it's just fantastic. I think it's had some really great acting. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. How, how was um, the COVID for you and writing? 
Um, I got, well, I did get COVID once, but I only got the sniffles out of it. Um, I liked the two months off I got off of work while I was being paid. <laughs> It also helped me write my book a little faster. <laughs> Otherwise, it wasn't that big a deal for me, but I, I, I tend to think it's because a lot of people who read horror or, or dark fantasy or enjoy you know, Clive Barker stuff or um, Edgar Allan Poe or anything like that, a lot of, the, a lot of us who do that are a bit desensitized um, to that sort of thing, in my opinion. Um, as one person uh, put it, I, I was talking to about it, uh, pointed out, we're more like, um, it's like, okay, this is COVID, where's the zombies? <laughs> so, in the basement yeah <laughs> yeah as Bugs Bunny would say don't go down there it's dark <laughs> I do have one more anecdote for Dave for the Wizard of Oz okay, okay. Then give it to yeah. him he loves it I guess uh, Margaret Hamilton was at a um, convention at one point when she was still alive and they had um, someone ask her about how she got the part of the Wicked Witch of the West and she said well she was a um, kindergarten teacher originally yeah believe it or not <laughs> And uh, she wanted to get in the movies, and she heard that the, 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 the Wizard of Oz was going on, so she got herself an agent, and she said she was sitting home one day, and the agent called her up and said, congratulations, you got the part for the Wizard of Oz. And she said, on the phone, she goes, oh, great, what part? He said, well, the witch, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, great. The damn Boy, like, witch. Yeah, I always like Margaret Hamilton. She has a great sense of humor. Every time I see her in films or, or TV, she's always had a great sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, um, it's been a great conversation. We're glad you came on the show. Um, the book, of course, we're talking about is The Grand Game, and our guest is Tim Aaron. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate everything you guys do, and I look forward to listening to more of your shows later on. Thanks, Tim. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.